Thanks for joining us on Wellness Talk Radio. I'm Chris Costello, and today we are talking with Tracy Jackson, author of Gratitude and Trust. Tracy, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. This is really a treat. First of all, it's just great to have you on the show, and and I thoroughly enjoyed reading the book. Uh, It's a really interesting book because a lot of it is about recovery, but it's not just recovery for addicts. And I'm wondering, you know, you say straight out that you, that you have you don't have a problem, or you never have had a problem with alcohol abuse or no. drug abuse, and so never. yeah, never so took anything. I like had the most boring teenage twenties. I was like the only one. So. Yeah, I kind of laughed actually reading your t- your part of the book because it reminded me so much of my growing up, and I had the same thing with, with singing. Were you scared too? Uh, singing the songs, you know, constantly, and then uh, it just never occurred to me to to use alcohol or drugs. It just, and I must have been scared on some level. I probably of my dad, you know, he would have. It just wasn't even in the vocabulary there, and so it was interesting to see your take on it. So the book talks about uh, affirmations. And you've got six of them that can change people's lives. We do. Well, you know, the book, the book deals, as you know, with recovery. Our, our principle and our theme is really recovery is not just for addicts because everyone's addicted to something, you know. So what I, and the great thing about this is everybody will find something in there that they can sort of point out being themselves. And while I didn't take drugs and I, you know, I mean, I, I had a drink. I'm not going to say that I'd like to, you know. I will have a glass of wine at night, but I literally can't stop at one. I've never really been an addictive personality in terms of substance. But there was no question for 20 years I was pretty engrossed and and addicted to negative thinking patterns. I had a history of a bad relationship with my father, which led me, you know, 20 years searching to find the right relationship, which made me very unhappy. I mean, I really had a lot of, I was angry, I think, about a lot of things. So I think that we all glom on to certain character traits, certain behavioral patterns that are subconscious most of the time. And they, as I say in the book, you know, when you get to the fork in the road, you take the knife. You know, we sabotage ourselves along the way, oftentimes not aware of what we're doing. And then we wake up and go, oh, poor me. Why isn't my life working out? Why am I this age? And I don't have the husband. I don't have the job. Or I don't have, you know, I don't look like the way I want to look. And I'm unhappy. I'm angry. Whatever it might be. So... Our theory is that there are these six affirmations that work for people in recovery. You know, they're different, but they're, the principles are the same. And if they work for people who are in recovery, who really have serious life-threatening issues, why can't they work for all those of us who just have life-limiting issues? And that's everybody, I think. I don't know anyone who doesn't have some life-limiting issue they walk around with. Yeah, and it was interesting, Tracy, that the life limiting, I want to talk a little bit about that with you because uh, the book was funny for reading for me because I thought, oh, this will be a a walk in the park. You know, I I don't have any alcohol addictions. You know, I'm going to enjoy this, you know. And the more I read, I went, "Uh uh-oh, you know, I've got some of these life limiting behaviors and and what do you do about them? But what are some of the ones that that you think people have that that are tough to deal with? Whoa, okay, well, there, you know, look, you can start with their, the victim, okay? I know so many people who are the victim. Nothing's ever their fault. Everything's somebody else's fault. You know, if, if there's not a parking place, it's because that jerk in front of me just took it. It's not that, like, maybe I, if I got, if I was better with time management and I wasn't running late and I had time, you know, people, time to look, people really blame their problems on a lot of people. People blame their parents. You know, look, I've had I had difficulty, terrible time with my father, still do. But I can't blame him for my problems. I have to fix them. You know, anger issues. There are people fear. People are terribly fearful. They're fearful of mistakes. They're fearful of success. They avoid success because they think, actually, what if I went after something and I failed? Then, you know, it's pretty much easier just not to go after it at all because then I can just say I never went after it, so I never failed. People are afraid of intimacy. People are afraid to lose the extra weight. People people are lazy. And I don't mean that in a mean way, but people will say oftentimes I just don't want to do the work. They slip. People are full of shame. I, you know, it's, it's pretty endless, the problems that we all have, that we tend to push away. And, and what medicating oneself through either, you know, if, we're, if it's drugs and alcohol, yeah. And we're not the people to go to. You've got to go to the proper channels for that. 
But people medicate themselves with shopping. They make themselves feel better with gambling. They make themselves feel better with sex. They make themselves feel better now on the Internet. There's any number of ways we can divert ourselves and make ourselves feel okay in the moment, even if it's just passing the buck. So that's just a sampling of some of the things that we deal with in the book. Uh, and uh, there are, like, we have a thing that I like to talk about called uh, reaching for a bottle of disappointment. There are many people who... The first place they go to is being disappointed. You know, they meet someone, they meet a guy, they get a job, something good happens in their life, but they're so set in their mind that they're that this is going to turn out badly, right? That they make it turn out badly because then they go, well, I was right, it was going to turn out badly, and they don't try, and then they stack and bemoan to all their friends, oh, nothing ever works, the world's a terrible place, everyone's against me. You know, the lesson is you are the master of your ship, and the first thing that has to change is you. And, and that's a very powerful place to start from. Something needs to change. It's probably me, our first affirmation. You can change, but you have to want to do it. That's what people in recovery get to. People who make recovery work, they say, I have a problem with drugs and alcohol. Only I can change. That's the, that's the jumping off point. That's what really always appeals to about the, about the program of recovery, which is people take responsibility for their behavior. And most people I know have a way of not taking responsibility for their behavior oftentimes. And it's interesting, Tracy, in gratitude and trust, that first affirmation that something needs to change and it's it's probably me, it's so shocking when you first read it. At least it was for why me. Why is that? It, it just, tell me why. It was because I thought, you know, I I have always kind of gone through my life thinking it's circumstances. It's It's somebody else doing something. And to read that and see that, it, it's such a powerful statement. It well, is where it I'm, starts. I'm really, I'm, no, I'm glad it is because, I, well, I think also, you know, what happens is that we, and what you say, you know, it is somebody else's fault. I think that even if it is somebody else's fault, okay, and there are times in life when things are not our fault. There's no question. Bad things happen to us. People behave like jerks. And we have a chapter in the book called Navigating the Nasties. There are people you're going to have the, you know, the arrogant boss, you're going to have the impossible sibling, you're going to have the difficult parent, you know, you're going to, you've got no one in your life, not everyone's going to be perfect, right? So you're going to bump up against throughout the world, truly imperfect situations, time and time and time again. Life is a truly rocky road, and it's not, you know, it's fluid, and you move from one to the other. But you're not going to change the arrogant guy down the hall. You have to change how you respond to him, and I think that's a big lesson for all of us. You, by adjusting your own behavior to negative people in your life, you, they then have to change a bit too because they're, not, they're used to responding in a certain way. So it really all begins and ends with us. And so, Tracy, if somebody's stuck like in these life-limiting behaviors, you know, wh- why is that so dangerous? Why, why, you know, why can that really be a problem for people? Well, you know, some are more dangerous than others. Let's, take, let's just take food. Food is the biggest problem in America. Sugar addiction is the number one addiction. Outweighs drugs, alcohol, everything, okay? Um, 68% of Americans are fat, 38% are obese. People cannot seem to get off sugar. Now, that's a really life, that's a serious situation because diabetes, heart disease, all the things that involve. But people find a million excuses not to work out, not to do what they're supposed to do. Somehow, you know, I'll start tomorrow. Um, I have a thing I say in the book called soon is not a time. You know, right now is a time, but you'll often find that people say soon I will do something. People tend to, when they slip, they'll start a program and they slip, and then they go, all right, well, I had the cheesecake, so I'll, you know, I'll have the fries, and then tonight I'll have a pasta, I'll have the pizza, and then, you know, I'll start tomorrow, and then tomorrow really never comes. So there's, there's serious issues like food addiction that really do mess with your future and can kill you. Uh, general malaise and unhappiness and being stuck may not, in the end, be just the, the worst thing, let's say, like dying of heroin addiction. But it's certainly going to make it so you're not living a productive, happy, fulfilling life. And the thing that we all want, and we all know that life is short, you know, it's, we're here for a limited period of time, why not get the best out of it? Why not make the most of the time you're given? And why not be the best person you can be? And when you're stuck and you can't move forward, you tend to be unhappy. So you'll hear people talk about this relationship hasn't worked. You know, I've been in a happy relationship for 10 years, 7 years, 12 years. 
Well, something's got to change, and it's probably you. And if that means you have to leave that relationship, if it's not going to work, then you have to leave that relationship because it's not going to work. But people just stay stuck. I mean, that's a great word. And and you're really right saying it. They just don't want to move. And I think they're addicted to the places they are. And I think that the devil known is sometimes better than the devil unknown. And I think that they don't know how to move forward. And I think it's sometimes easier to blame a situation. It's it's any number of things. But the, the solution is a very simple one. It's something needs to change. And it's me. And you have to take that chance. You just have to, you have to want it, I think. I think you have to want to have and feel you deserve to have the best life you can possibly have. And that's, that's our goal. So is it dangerous in the sense that you're going to get, you know, drunk? But yes, you're drunk and you get behind the wheel of a car and you kill someone, that's dangerous. In the end, oftentimes, the person we're hurting the most is ourselves. And, and those perhaps around us and our families and what have you. But, but being unhappy, being unfulfilled, not being the best we can be, having issues that keep us from what we want. That hurts our, that's what's hurting us. So, so is it dangerous? I don't know. Dangerous is such a big word. Dangerous means it's like the house is on fire. But, you know, it's certainly, like, again, it's life limiting. And why live a, why live a limited life? Life's a, life's a great thing. You know, we should be grateful for every second we're here, the gratitude, the trust. Why live a limited life? Live the best life you can live. Yeah, and it's interesting. Things change so quickly when you kind of reverse that thinking, when you when you shift that thinking around to, you know, it, it, it begins with me. It's probably me. It's not them. And, and, you know, anybody that has a teenager knows how tough that is. Teenagers love that blame thing, you know, if only I had better parents. Teenagers, absolutely. I mean, teenagers, I mean, I have a 14-year-old and a 23-year-old. My 14-year-old is now in the place of, you know, she's getting back. You, know, every, you wake up one day and everything is your fault, right, as a parent. Everything is your fault. Um, and you just kind of get through that, and they wake up and they're 23, and then they go, oh, I guess it really wasn't your fault after all. Some people never outgrow that. <laughs> Some people stay stuck in, in, that, in that pattern that they learn in, in their teens. And that's, that's pretty – that is it's dangerous for the people around you because if you're with people and you're blaming them for your problems, they're either going to walk away or they're going to feel pretty terrible about themselves. That's where our, our affirmation of apologizing comes in. But you certainly don't want to burden other people with your emotional issues because we all have our own emotional issues. So I think that projecting that onto others is very unfair. And I think we all, we're all guilty of that at times in our life. I don't think there's any really poor behavior thing that most of us aren't guilty at some time or another. You're listening to Wellness Talk Radio. We're talking with Tracy Jackson, author of Gratitude and Trust, Six Affirmations That Will Change Your Life. And that's written with Paul Williams and Tracy Jackson. I'm Chris Costello. You can check out our website at wellnesstalkradio.com. All right. So Tracy, one of the other things is I'll learn from my mistake and not defend them. And boy, mistakes, we're taught early on that, hey, mistakes aren't okay and avoid them. And actually, if you ever do research, the most successful people, they make a zillion mistakes along the way and somehow they just, you know, they get to the top. Well, why is it so important to look at our mistakes? Mistakes are our greatest teachers. I think we're we're taught exactly as you say that Mistakes are something to be ashamed of. Mistakes are something that we hide from. And one of the things I love about recovery is they, people in recovery own their mistakes you know, together, and, and, and they're taught to embrace those mistakes and learn from them and move, move forward from them. And we're taught at an early age that mistakes are things, that that shows that we're not doing well or that we're not as good as someone else. But if I look at all the mistakes I've made in my life, either they've been gifts in some way or another, Or if I look at them clearly and openly and not defensively, I try and say to myself, okay, what is my lesson in this? Now, what is my lesson in this? You know, if you just use the thing on you, road rage these days. People are just, everybody's in a rush. All the freeways are jammed. People drive around parking lots and take someone's space and they swear at the other person. You know, there's all this kind of anger and hostility and there's not enough time and there's not enough space. you know, so let's say you're, you're going to an appointment and you're, you're not great with time management. You're always late. So you're 20 minutes late. Someone takes your parking place. Then you yell at chew out that person. Then you're angry at the guy in the elevator. You're angry at the girl that's the desk. It's supposed to saying, okay, let me learn from this. Maybe if I got up 
20 minutes earlier and I had my act together and my house wasn't a total mess and I had gas in the car, I wouldn't find myself late and I wouldn't find myself behind the eight ball and I wouldn't find myself then really angry at everyone around me for something I should have taken care of early that morning. That's a very small example, but it's something that we see all the time. These things start with us. You can make bigger mistakes, mistakes in, in partners. You know, we learn you learn from people along the way to make mistakes. I don't think there's anyone that's listening to this who hasn't made the wrong love choice at one time in their life. That's how you learn to be the right person. But you got to look at what was wrong with that relationship. What did that relationship teach me about myself? What I need from someone else? What I can give to someone else? Character traits I like? Character traits that I just can't live with? Everything we know, everything we we experience is you know you look at where we messed up along the way. That's a guideline as to how we do better tomorrow. So I think one should embrace it and sit down and write it. I made this big mistake today, and what is my lesson in that? And when I stop myself and I don't defend my behavior and I look at it honestly, I do say, Tracy, what can I learn from this? What, what, what is my lesson here? Sometimes the lesson doesn't come right away. Sometimes you have to sit and be, be patient. You're not always going to get everything the second you ask for it, certainly. But I think the lesson will come to you and the knowledge will come to you if you, if you quietly oftentimes wait for it. And so, Tracy, I'm curious, in gratitude and trust, out of the affirmations, what was the most challenging one for you to deal with, personally? I would have to say, that's a good question, because I never thought I being challenging. People usually ask which one I like the best. I think that sometimes, for me, trust will cause a problem. I've learned to trust. I've had to teach myself to learn to trust. Uh Gratitude comes easily to me. Sometimes I'm not trusting of people. Sometimes I'm not trusting of situations. Uh, and that stems back to my childhood. I think many, most people's subconscious issues do stem back to their childhood. You very seldom find someone who says, you know, at 40 years old, someone insulted me, and, you know, ever since then I've been, you know, I've had this issue. I think most of it stems back to when we were young and the things we absorbed and saw around us or how we were treated. So I... I don't trust as easily as many people, and I've had to learn to trust. That, that's probably been my biggest challenge. I trust myself oddly. I trust myself quite well, usually. But I don't trust other people as much as I trust myself. And that's something I've had to learn to do, is put my faith in other people in a bigger way. Is it a matter of figuring out who to trust? Yeah, I think, you know, my father left when I was very young, and has been a very inconsistent figure. And um, I think when that happens to you, at a young age, you're not quite sure who you can trust in the world because I think we all think we're supposed to be able to trust our parents. Certainly, that's for the first early years. That's what you. That's all, the only people you can trust. So if you can't trust them, and I've never felt that I could actually trust my father, that leaves a place in you where trust is. There's a question behind with that. You know, after the word trust, who can I trust? If this person who's supposed to love me unconditionally can't, doesn't, won't whatever the situation may be, um, then trust becomes much more of an issue. And it's something you overcome as you go through life, and I, and I have been able to overcome it. But I would be lying to you if I said, and I'm not so far from a perfect person, this is funny, that there weren't days when I my fallback position to go to is, oh, I can't trust someone. You know, it will turn out like it did with Dad. That That's what I will, that's, that's what I will hear or see in the situation. It's probably totally unrelated. It's just it's so ingrained in me on a certain level that I can't quite escape it. But then I'll stop myself and I'll say, okay, you know, this is not your father. You are not four years old. You are a 56-year-old grown woman. This is an entirely different situation. And I talk myself down off that ledge of not trusting. But I've had to learn how to do it, and it's taken me 56 years. <laughs> so it doesn't happen overnight. But the book is a great place to start. Yeah, and it's kind of interesting with the, the one of the affirmations, uh, I don't know how to do this, but something inside me does. And I think that kind of rings true for getting through those kinds of issues too, right? I mean, I know I've experienced that in my own life. Yeah, well, that's our spiritual step, certainly. Um, I don't know how to do this, but something inside me does. And and that step can really be, sorry, step affirmation, that can, that can be interpreted by anyone probably in any way they want. For us, it means... Just take it out of you. We don't care what you believe in. Because people often have a hard time with spirituality. Some, some people have a hard time with God, with higher power. That's just something that they really want to steer clear of for their own personal reasons, which 
I'm totally non-judgmental about whatever people want to believe or not believe is none of my business. And I don't want anyone judging what I believe or don't believe. But what we'd like is for people just to have a little trust and faith in something, uh, you know, even if it's the ocean, if it's the mountains, if it's their dog, if it's coffee. It doesn't really matter. If it's whatever gets you through the day, just sometimes have to hand it over because we often burden ourselves and we try and manipulate things and we think we know what's best for us. And when sometimes what's required in life is to just hand it over. I mean, I, I have something I call a hand it over box. And if I have a big problem that I'm just torturing myself with, I'll write down, please help me out with this. And I'll write down the problem and I zip it up and I put it in the box. And then the only time I'm allowed to think about that problem is if I take it out of the box consciously and stare at it, then I have to give the box back. I get to give the problem back. The problem has to be taken away from me. I have to hand it over. Sometimes that's what's required. It's not necessarily that the big guy in the sky. It's just I'm handing it over to the powers that be, whoever they may be, wherever they may be, to help me through this situation. I don't have what it takes to do it. I need to have faith in something and trust in something. And those are the big life issues, which we will all face, and we all do face. Health issues, death issues. You know, life, life has a lot of problems, and, and I think there's a whole there's this whole happiness movement that we're all going to be eternally smiley-faced and happy 24-7, which we also don't. We don't sell that. It's very important, I think, to look at your problems and accept your problems and not run away from them. If you wake up and there's something to be sad about, you should embrace that sadness. You should just feel that sadness, understand where it's coming from, and understand it will pass. But by pushing problems away and pushing feelings of discomfort away. That's where a lot of addiction comes from. We're, we're medicating ourselves or we're removing those feelings from ourselves by doing something that distracts us and makes us feel good. But we, we should not medicate ourselves away from our feelings. Are, our feelings are true. Feelings are truth. I, I think that is absolutely paramount. Feelings are truth. So if you're feeling sad, if you're feeling angry, if you're feeling upset, if you're feeling hurt, look at that feeling. Now, don't go to the mall and buy a dress and pretend it doesn't exist. Look at what's going on in your life. Don't, you know, don't have just three glasses of Chardonnay and pretend it doesn't exist. There's information in those feelings. And by embracing them and getting through them, you come out the other side. By medicating them or pushing them away, by distracting yourself through any number of pleasure stimulators, you're simply procrastinating dealing with what's really bothering you. So I've learned if I'm sad, I'm sad, and I'll be sad, and then I know I'll get over it. And if you, at that point, it doesn't have the power over you. I think that's a very important lesson in life. It is. And, and Tracy, one of the things you mentioned in Gratitude and Trust is uh, that you uh, had certain ideas and expectations of what you'd want to be doing with your life. I mean, obviously, you've been a very successful writer and had lots of career success. But how did the, the things you thought you were going to do differ uh, from what you've actually done? Well, if you asked me 10 years ago if I thought I was going to be writing a book like this at this stage of my life, I probably would have laughed at you. I think that there's been great, that this has been a great gift and a great surprise to get to do this with Paul, who was my childhood idol, and to write this book, which which has been just such a learning experience and a growth experience. And it's, I think it's helping people. It's just, it, it's a wonderful, wonderful thing. I think the biggest surprise I had in my life, work-wise, when I was young, I thought I would be an actress. And then that, I knew that wasn't going to work by the time I was 30. So I, I adjusted and I started writing. I learned a lot of that from my mother, who's been a good role model in, in changing, teaching me how to change gears and reinvent herself all through her life. You know, and I think that we, we go into life oftentimes thinking we're going to have one career and or do one thing or one relationship. And when that doesn't work out, we have a very hard time accepting that life moves on, that this relationship may not work forever, this career may not work forever. I probably thought one of the biggest things that, that was a stumbling block for me was when I was turning 50 and my screenwriting career that had been really, really good for 20 years started to drift away. And it wasn't because of anything I did. It was just merely circumstances. It was the industry changed. I was getting older. I was a comedy writer. It just, the films that probably should have made tons of money, a couple of them didn't make tons of money, and that affected the way I was perceived. And I realized that I had to make a career change. And I had some, I had about six months of real dark nights of the soul where I'd go into my office and put my head on my desk and cry. But out of that came a book I wrote called Between a Rock and a Hot Place, My 50 is Not the New 30. 
And that was a gift, you know, that career shift, that, 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 that no from the universe. No, you're not going to be a screenwriter forever. I thought I would be, you know, get to probably 70 and get to write funny movies and be a funny girl and do all, you know, do what I've been doing my whole life. And I didn't. But, you know, Paul likes to say no is a gift. And that no was a gift. And I remember I wrote on my on my bulletin board in my office where I'd written all my movies. I had a big whiteboard where I used to break down my screenplays. And I wrote uh, the Robert Lowell quote, which I loved, Fate Loves the Fearless. And a quote from Virginia Woolf, which is, arrange the pieces that are put in front of you. And I think a lot of people, when they get in their 40s and 50s, all of a sudden maybe their career isn't what it was, and they have to make choices, which we, almost all of us will have to do. You have to, you have to be... You have to be agile enough and you have to be flexible enough to learn it may be time to make a change and what is that change. And sometimes be patient for the knowledge of what that change is or try different things until something works. But that certainly was a period for me of of great information. And and now when I look at it, people will say to me, oh, don't you wish you were writing movies? Because you'll think writing movies is a very glamorous, fabulous thing to do, which it can be in moments and it can be agonizing and torturous with others. I think I would, there's nothing in the world I would, rather be doing than what I'm doing today. And I could have never predicted that. I could have never thought, that. I never dreamt, you know, in my, in my life that I would be doing what I do today. And it's one of the great periods in my life. So life surprises you. And you have to remain open to those, to those moments and to those gifts that come from somewhere else and say, they nudge you in a direction and say, that, go there, turn right. If you turn right and go behind that door, you're going to find something pretty wonderful. And you have that's trust then, right? You've got to go to the place of trust. There is something there that's good for you. Oh, that's a wonderful quote. Arrange the pieces that are put in front of you. Isn't that? Yeah, I, I love that quote. And and so a lot of women, and I, and I lecture a lot of women who get to be in their 50s and, and, and they get confused because a lot of people have given up their careers or careers changes. There is ageism in the workforce, especially if you're a woman. I, I do believe these things exist. And so I say to them, you know, arrange the pieces that are put in front of you. Follow your passion. Make the next 30 years count. Do something. And you can. You can. You just got to do it. I mean, my mother is 86 years old, and she's just taken up painting. You know, I mean, I, I think that's just amazing. She goes to painting classes three times a week at Santa Barbara City College. And she loves it at 86, giving her a whole new thing to do. There's always something new to do. You know, as long well as you stay healthy and curious and agile. Uh, and what a great attitude, and what a great uh, attitude that she She's passed on to you with the reinvention. I mean, that's so so critical in life, I think. I think it's essential, and especially now the way the world works. I mean, I, it, it, the world that exists today, certainly in the workforce, is not the world that I grew up you know, the, in or that my grandparents lived in or probably even my parents lived in. I, I think it's a very different world, and people do do many things now, and, and they do many things over the course of their life. And I think that's always a shock to people. I, I don't think they're prepared for that. And that now that we live longer, healthier, people used to retire at six, right, 60, 62, and they'd go off and play golf. Well, now people are really vibrant until they're in their 80s for a lot of time. And, you know, they just don't want to be sitting on a rocking chair. They, they need to do something. So they have to find something to do. And that's where they have to arrange the pieces that are put in front of them. And so, Tracy, I also want to just ask you, you know, with gratitude and trust, there's a ton of information in there about just reinventing your life and getting through difficult times. And But I, I know there must be something in there that you think, you know, that you'd really want people to take away from reading that. And what really stands out for you? I think one of the big lessons that I like people to take away, and I, I don't know if it's ever actually verbalized in the book in these words. It's something that I, I tell my children all the time, and I find some of the best lessons I have, the lessons I do tell my children, is it's so much better to be loved than be right. And I think that people so desperately want to be right, right in their convictions, right in the choices they've made. It gets back to what you talked about earlier with them being stuck. But, and, and in standing firmly on the land of right, we often push love away and opportunity away. And so when you get into that place, you ask yourself, do I want to be loved? Do I want to live in a life full of love, or do I want to be right? And that goes back to something needs to change, and it's probably me, you know? How I look at the world, how I engage the world. Do I need it all to be my way, the way I've always thought it to be very rigidly? Or am I flexible? Is love more important than being acknowledged for how smart I am or what good choices I've made or how everything I think is the right thing. I, I think that that's a huge thing. I think it's a huge thing. 
Well, Tracy, we want to thank you so much for joining us on Wellness Talk Radio today. And uh, I know people are going to be, you're on a big book tour right now, and I know they'll be looking for you and and Paul Williams. Once again, just thank you for being on the show today. Well, thank you for having me. This has been a great discussion.